We now come to the motion on criminal law. I call the Minister to move the motion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I beg to move that this House approves the Draft Criminal Justice Act 2003 Requisite and Minimal Custodial Periods Order 2024. Uh, Mr Speaker, following the announcement I made on February 12 and an oral statement to the House last Thursday, members will know that our prisons are in crisis. The male prison estate has been running at around 99 per cent capacity for 18 months, and we now know that my predecessor warned 10 Downing Street of the perils of inaction. And rather than address this crisis, the former Prime Minister called an election and left us a time bomb ticking away. If we do not act now and that bomb goes off, our prisons will reach full capacity and the justice system will grind to a halt. The courts would have to stop holding trials, the police would be unable to make arrests, with criminals free to act without consequence, the public will be put at risk. If we do not act now, this nightmare will become reality by September. We have explored all the options available to us. In the precious little time that we have, we cannot build more prisons or add more prison blocks, and we cannot fit out an existing site to make it secure enough to hold offenders. While we are deporting foreign national offenders as fast as legally possible, we cannot do so quickly enough to address this crisis. And while we must make progress on the remand population, those who are in prison while they await trial, such measures take time that we do not have. This has left us with only one option to avert disaster. The statutory instrument that we are considering today will change the law so prisoners serving eligible standard determinate sentences will have their automatic release point adjusted to 40 rather than 50 per cent of their sentence. This will mean that around 5,500 offenders will be released in two tranches in September and October. They will leave prison a few weeks er or months early to serve the rest of their sentence under strict licence conditions in the community. Thereafter, all qualifying sentences will continue to be subject to the new 40 per cent release point. So let me turn to the detail of this uh, legislation, the sentences that qualify for this measure and those that do not. Firstly, Madam Deputy Speaker, this change applies to both male and female offenders. This is a legal necessity and addresses the pressure in both the male and the female prison estate. While this measure does not apply to those serving in the youth estate, where capacity pressures are less acute, it does apply to a few individuals serving sentences under Section 250 of the Sentencing Act 2020. Most of those serving these sentences are serving long terms that are excluded from this measure, as I will go on to explain. However, a few are in scope and are included because they are likely to end their term in the adult estate. The, the provision also includes those on a detention in a young offenders institution sentence who are 18 to 20 year olds who are held in adult prisons. As such, both contribute to the capacity crisis. While this measure must address the crisis in our prisons, we have balanced this alongside measures to protect the public. There will, therefore, be certain sentences that are excluded. The worst violent and sexual crimes, which are subject to a 67 per cent release, will not be eligible. Neither will violent offences subject to a sentence of four years or more under Part 1 of Schedule 15 to the Criminal Justice Act 2003. Sexual offences will be excluded, including offences related to child sexual abuse and grooming, and we will exclude a series of offences linked, linked to domestic abuse, including stalking, controlling or coercive behaviour and non-fatal strangulation. National security offences under the Official Secrets Act, National Security Act 2023, and offences determined to have been carried out for a foreign power will also be excluded, as will serious terrorism offences and terrorism-connected offences, which remain subject to a 67 per cent release at the Parole Board's discretion. So too, terrorism, uh, terrorism offences currently subject to a 50 per cent release. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. 
Minister, for her statement and very clearly understand, Madam Deputy Speaker, the predicament the government is in and the reason for bringing forward these, these uh, uh, legislative changes. Um, one of the things over the last few years that I've had as elected representative, I believe everybody in this House has had as well, are those who are victims have, have to face the predicament of the perpetrator of the crime being on the street and some day they may even meet them uh, and, and the trauma that that brings back is enormous. So I welcome what the Minister is saying in relation to the conditions that will that will um, be um, have precedent when it comes to those who are being released. But can those victims who are worried about what's happening, can they be reassured by the Minister today? I think we need to have that reassurance on the record in this House, Madam Deputy Speaker. Those people are worried. They want to be assured. I very much thank the Honourable uh, Gentleman for his intervention. He raises an incredibly important uh, point, and I've had uh, you know, the feelings of victims very much in my mind as I've been uh, forced to make uh, th this decision. Um, nothing in relation to victim notification scheme or the victim contact scheme will change as a result of these measures. All of the usual uh, arrangements will apply, and I will come on to detail some of those uh, a little later uh, in my speech. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, re returning to those uh, offences that are are excluded. Let me just uh, say, in each case uh, of exclusions, we have excluded specific offences rather than cohorts of offenders. That is a legal necessity. It is only possible to make this change in law with reference to qualifying sentences. Uh, in addition to these exclusions, there will be stringent protections in place around any early release. This change to the law will not take effect until September. This gives our hard-working probation service a crucial uh, six-week implementation period. Probation officers will therefore have the time they need to assess the risk of each offender and prepare a plan to manage them safely in the community. All offenders released under this policy will be subject to stringent licence conditions. Where necessary, multi-agency public protection arrangements will be put in place to protect the public, as will multi-agency risk assessment conferences, which ensure that victims can be protected. Victims eligible for the Victim Contact Scheme or the Victim Notification Scheme will be notified about releases and developments in their cases. Offenders will be ordered to wear electronic tags where required. Exclusion zones and curfews will be imposed where appropriate, and crucially, if an offender breaks any of these conditions that are imposed upon them, they can be returned to prison immediately. Well, I'm sure the whole House will be pleased to hear the safeguards that she's putting in place here. Is she confident that by the time the, the changes to the scheme come into effect, that both victim notification and probation, and indeed police and accommodation services will be in a position to pick up those who are being released. I thank my honourable friend uh, for his uh, intervention. Uh, this is precisely why we have made sure that we have an implementation period for this uh, policy change. Uh, that work will continue at pace over the summer, and it is so that uh, the probation service has the time to prepare proper release plans uh, for offenders who will be released as a result of these changes, uh, and to make sure that all of our obligations to victims and the wider public um, are fulfilled. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, let me uh, also be clear. This change is not permanent. We will review this measure within 18 months of implementation, at the very latest in March 2026. At this point, we believe the situation in our prisons will have stabilised, and we will be able to reverse this measure, returning to the automatic point of release to 50 per cent of a sentence. I want to directly address a question raised during the oral statement in the House last week. We have not included a specific sunset clause within this legislation, which would end it automatically. We have pledged to be honest about the challenges in our prisons and the changes that we put in place to rise to them. This is a marked difference from the previous administration's approach. Given the scale of the crisis that we have inherited, placing an artificial time limit on this measure would be nothing more than an irresponsible gimmick. Yeah, yeah. We have taken the very deliberate decision not to reverse this measure until we are certain that prison capacity has stabilised. The last government allowed our prisons to fall into crisis. We will not introduce legislation that could force us back there again. And finally, we will introduce a new, higher standard of transparency. 
Every quarter, we will publish data on the number of offenders released, and we will make it a statutory requirement for a prison capacity statement to be published annually, introducing this legislation as soon as parliamentary time allows. We are clear that this is the only safe way forward. Madam Deputy Speaker, members of the House do not simply have to take my word for it. We have heard senior figures in the police, prisons and probation all warning of what would happen if these measures are not taken. We have even heard my predecessor as Lord Chancellor come out in support of this measure. Thanks to the action, or rather inaction, of the last Prime Minister, our predecessors ran the prison estate to within days of disaster. Yeah. As a result, they were forced to introduce a series of emergency measures, like Operation Safeguard, which turned prison cells, uh, in, police cells into prison overflow, and Operation Early Dawn, a daily triage system which managed the flow of prisoners from police cells to the courts. They even came perilously close to triggering Operation Brinker, which is effectively a one-in, one-out measure into our prisons. And it is the very last desperate act available to forestall, by a matter of days, the total collapse of law and order in this country. The last Government also introduced the flawed end-of-custody supervised licence scheme, so-called ECSL. When this new legislation takes effect, it will be my pleasure to end ECSL. With next to no implementation period, ECSL released offenders with only a few days of warning and sometimes none at all. This gave the probation services no time to assess the risk of offenders and next to no time to plan how they would be managed safely in the community. This new legislation, with its longer eight-week implementation period, gives the probation services the time they need to prepare. The last Government's early release scheme did not have the same exclusions that this new legislation has. Most notably, it provided no exclusions for offences linked to domestic abuse. That meant no exclusions for stalking, no exclusions for strangulation or for controlling or coercive behaviour, and no exclusions for breaches of restraining orders, non-molestation orders and domestic abuse orders, all of which are excluded in the legislation presented to this House today. Perhaps worst of all, this quick fix was carried out under a veil of secrecy. A number of extensions were made to the scheme, which first released offenders up to 18 days early, then 35 days early, 60 days early, and then finally up to 70 days early. That last extension was impl implemented without any announcement at all. And throughout, no data was ever published by the previous government on the numbers that were being released. And so it fell to this administration to reveal the true scale of the ECSL scheme. Only now do we know that over 10,000 offenders were rushed out under that veil of secrecy by the last administration. Our approach will be different. Unlike under the previous government, those sitting opposite will never have to chase me around this building to get a hold of the numbers. They will be put in the public domain for all to see and scrutinise, as they should have been all along. Yeah, yeah. ECSL was one of a series of decisions that this government believes must be examined more fully, which is why I have announced a review into how this capacity crisis was allowed to happen. It will look at why the necessary decisions were not taken at critical moments, and we will be appointing an independent chair shortly for this review, which will conclude by the end of the year. Madam Deputy Speaker, let me be clear. The crisis in our prisons is not over. The prison population remains within a few hundred places of collapse. Last week, we temporarily closed HMP Dartmoor, taking around 200 places out of the prison estate. While we are able to withstand that loss of capacity, any further changes, be that a further loss of supply or an unexpected increase in demand, could tip us into crisis. And the measures that I have set out will take effect in September, giving probation officers the precious time they need to prepare. During this time, we will continue to monitor the prison population closely, and we will be ready to introduce further emergency measures, like Operation Early Dawn or Operation Safeguard, if required. We are not yet out of the woods. Uh, uh, yes, I will. Thank you. I have three prisons in Doncaster East and the Isle of Axome. 
Will the Minister explain, please, just how bad the situation will be if we do not act today? Thank my hon. Friend for uh, that intervention. If we do not act today, uh, we face a total collapse of law and order in this country. If we are forced to um, operationalise Operation Brinker, that is a one-in, one one-out system, and we are then days away from the total collapse of the criminal justice system. It is a shocking uh, state uh, of affairs that the previous government is entirely responsible for, and it has fallen to our administration to start to put these matters right with the decisive action that we are taking. This is the only option on the table. I remind the House again, we have no choice other than to pass this measure in order to deal with the crisis that we, are, that we have inherited. But even with passing this measure today, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are not yet going to be out of the woods. Our prisons are still in crisis. The last government ran the prison system on the basis of luck. They hung on by their fingernails until they could no longer, and then they called an election. This government will never run that risk. We will always take the necessary action. I give way. Well, uh, I thank the uh, Minister for her reassurance around the exclusion of sexual and domestic violence sentences. And while prisons are about punishment and keeping our community safe, one of the main ways we can keep our prison population down is through rehabilitation by rebuilding lives and reducing reoffending. Would the Minister agree with me that education is central to that rehabilitation? And will she meet with me and Milton Keynes College, who are the biggest provider of education in prisons, to discuss? how we can take this forward further. My honourable friend makes an incredibly important point. Uh, she is right that ultimately the long-term solution, uh, one of the long-term solutions to the capacity crisis has to be to reduce reoffending. I'm just coming on to that uh, point uh, in, in, in my speech. I'd happily uh, arrange for a meeting between her and the Prisons Minister and I will take a close interest uh, in what is happening in Milton, uh, in Milton Keynes. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, let us be under no illusion. The measures I have set out today is not a silver bullet. It does not end the prisons crisis. It is not the long-term solution. Instead, it buys us the time that we need to take further measures that can address the prisons crisis, not just now, but in the future. Later this year, we will publish a 10-year capacity strategy. This will outline the steps that the government will take to acquire land for new prison sites, and it will ensure that building prisons, infrastructure that we deem to be of national importance, is a decision placed in a minister's hands. We must also drive down reoffending. Today, all too often, our prisons create better criminals, not better citizens. Nearly 80% of offenders are reoffenders. A stronger probation service will be crucial to drive down reoffending, and we will start by recruiting at least 1,000 new trainee probation officers by the end of March 2025. That is bringing forward an existing commitment to address the immediate challenges that we face today. We will also work with prisons to ensure offenders can get the skills they need to contribute to society on their release, as well as bringing together prison governors, local employers and the voluntary sector to help them into work, because we know that having a job makes offenders less likely to re-offend. The last occupants of 10 Downing Street left our prisons in crisis. Yes, Thank you. Um, the Secretary of State will be aware that the cities of London and Westminster has, some of the, has the highest levels of rough sleeping in the country, with 2,050 people uh, rough sleeping every night in Westminster and 482 rough sleeping in the City of London. St Mungo's has highlighted that 68% of people released <coughs> from prison uh, on, into rough sleeping will re-offend re within the year. It is sim simply essential that a planning process and an ease assessment can take place before people are release. Local authorities simply do not have, with the responsibility for preventing homelessness, simply do not have the resources or the working processes uh, to make sure that this planning takes place. Can you reassure this House that those, those processes and resources will be in place before September uh, when this legislation will be implemented? Thank my honourable friend uh, for that uh, intervention. So I, I'd, I'd say two points. And it's an incredibly important uh, point on homelessness uh, and what that means for uh, recall, in particular, into prison. Uh, two points. Firstly, the implementation period does allow probation time to prepare the plans for every offender that will be released. That is very different to the previous government's ECSL scheme that gave uh, no time at all. So some of these uh, uh, issues will be mitigated by that implementation period. And offenders leaving prison can 
access transitional accommodation for up to 84 nights if they are at risk of being homeless. And those, uh, those provisions will continue as this scheme uh, is rolled out. Uh, I will. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I'm sure many of us will have been appalled by the comments of the former Lord Chancellor that this measure that is being taken by this government was not taken by the last government because, and I quote, you have to win votes. How does the Minister respond to that? I think the public uh, made the decision uh, for the previous administration by voting them out of office in such uh, a stunning uh, manner. Uh, you do have to win votes. It is a democracy at the end of the day, but you also have to govern the country in a way that doesn't, in a way that doesn't risk the total collapse of the criminal justice system. Uh, and it is a sign of the uh, Tory party's collective nervous breakdown when they were in government that they allowed the risk of running the criminal justice system into the ground, facing the total collapse of law and order in this country to happen in the first place. It is this government, this new administration, that will never take such a risk, and that is why we are taking the measures today to start to put things right and clean up the mess that we have inherited from the Tory party. Madam Deputy Speaker, the last occupants of 10 Downing Street left our prisons in crisis. They left our criminal justice system on the point of collapse. They were the guilty men. I know the historic weight of those words, but they are apt. The last government placed the country in unconscionable peril. The legacy of this government will be different. A prison system brought under control, a probation service that keeps the public safe, enough prison places to meet our needs, and prisons, probation and other services working together to break the cycle of reoffending. Today's measure is not the long-term solution. I am not pretending that it is. There is a hard road ahead of us, but this is the necessary first step. Madam Deputy Speaker, I beg to move. Yeah, yeah. The question is, as on the order paper, and I call the official opposition, Matt Vickers. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I congratulate you on taking up your place. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to debate the Criminal Justice Act 2003 requisite and minimum custodial periods order 2024, following on from the Lord Chancellor's statement on the issue of prison capacity last week. This statutory instrument is a significant one. So it's right that we have the opportunity to scrutinise, challenge and call on the Government for clear answers to a number of vitally important questions. While only five clauses and a schedule, the impact of this SI should not be underestimated, reducing as it does the automatic release point for criminals on standard determinate sentences, from 50% of their sentence to 40%, subject to some limited exclusions. As my right hon. Friend, the Shadow Lord Chancellor, has set out, we do recognise the challenges and significant pressure facing prisons and the criminal justice system and need to ensure they continue to function effectively. These pressures were well known to the then opposition. They are not some sudden new news. In government, in government, we took the decision to toughen sentences for those who commit the worst crimes to protect society. In parallel, we set in train the biggest prison building programme since the Victorian era, with thousands of additional places delivered and five of the six new prisons either built, in construction or with planning permission granted. But what had a huge impact on prison population was us taking the right decisions to not mass release prisoners in the pandemic and to not scrap trial by jury in the pandemic, meaning the number of remand prisoners awaiting trial or sentence increase from around 9,000 to around 16,500. Those decisions, not opposed by the then opposition, if I recall, were the right decisions, but now the Government that cannot credibly claim they did not know about them. Public protection must always be central to what the Lord Chancellor does, and in bringing forward this statutory instrument to reduce capacity pressure in prisons, we have to say we have very grave public protection concerns about the way in which the Government has gone about this in terms of the detail of that statutory instrument. When the Shadow Lord Chancellor pressed her on a number of our key concerns last week, she was unable to provide the reassurance and commitment sought. So we, so we debate this instrument today, and with its detail in front of her, I must press her again and hope she will respond in her wind-up remarks. By way of context, can the Lord Chancellor confirm the number of places available in the adult male estate as of this morning? noting that I believe it was around 700 when she made her statement, so the House can understand the rate of attrition of prison places. 
She failed last week to set out her criteria for ending this statutory instrument after 18 months. And more importantly, why does this statutory instrument not contain a sunset yeah, yeah, clause? Yeah, 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 yeah. I realise she touched on this, but surely, given the significance of these powers, it's reasonable to sunset such a measure. With the Lord Chancellor always able to return to the House subsequently to seek the House's agreement to renew it if needed, rather than giving her a blank cheque. Yeah. Based upon the SI and supporting documents, the Lord Chancellor does not appear to have put in place any exclusions to prevent the worst persistent repeat offenders who receive shorter sentences from benefiting. Is this correct? The SI sets the level of sentence below which prisoners will benefit from the changes as being under five years. Is she aware that the sentencing guidelines show that, for example, a Section 20 GBH wounding offence under the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act, GBH, a serious offence, uh, would attract a sentence of up to five years? <coughs> so would those who committed this offence benefit from her prisoner sentence reduction scheme? As we know, many offences... As we know, many offences linked to dreadful domestic there will be an opportunity to respond to me, I'm sure. As we know, many offences linked to dreadful domestic abuse and domestic violence do not appear to be amongst her exclusions. As the offence prosecute as the offence prosecuted is, for example, Section twenty GBH or common assault. What does she say to those victims of domestic abuse who are worried that the way in which this measure has been drafted could risk leaving their attackers able to benefit from her early release scheme. What assessment has she made of the percentage of those who were released at 40% of sentence served rather than 50% of sentence served that will be recalled back into prison for breaches? What steps is she taking to mandate the imposition, mandate the imposition of GPS tagging or other strict conditions on those benefiting from this? Again, there is no detail in the SI. What additional resources are being made available to probation by September of this year, when this early release scheme is due to start, over and above those already put in place by the previous government? She stated her plans for next March, but what about this September, when her scheme comes into place? How many additional staff will be in place in offender management units above the current staffing levels by September to meet the demands of sentence recalculation and release points? And what additional funding is the Ministry of Justice making available to local authorities and other housing providers to meet a short, medium-term increase in demand for suitable accommodation in the coming months? The Lord Chancellor confirmed last week her intention to temporarily fully close HMP Dartmoor. Where does she intend to find the places lost? And more broadly, in asking the House to support these open-ended measures in this SI, she is still yet to set out any detail of a long-term capacity plan? Either how will she pay for and build more prison places over and above those we already committed to, or whether she'll reverse the changes we made to toughen sentences for dangerous criminals? Which is it? What's the plan? While we recognise, while we recognise the need to address immediate pressures in the prison system, we are deeply troubled by the lack of detail in this statutory instrument and supporting documents, and the huge gaps as set out above that appear to exist. The blank cheque being asked for with no sunsetting of such a significant measure and no ability to amend this instrument to include one. Serious offences of which I have highlighted, which I have highlighted examples that appear not to be excluded that can often be linked, that can often be linked to domestic violence or wounding. The absence of such clarity and such measures mean that this instrument is drafted in a way that is deeply troubling. I look forward to the Lord Chancellor's response and reassurances during her wind-up remarks. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, I congratulate you on your election and welcome you to your place as Deputy Speaker. Uh, I welcome this uh, motion from my right honourable friend and Lord Chancellor in taking the only realistic action open to her in dealing with this critical issue of prison capacity, with our prisons projected to be overflowing by September. Now, this is another failing by the former Conservative Government as a result of the continuously kicking the can down the road rather than dealing with the issues at hand. The current situation cannot have come as a surprise to anyone who has been following developments in criminal justice over the last 14 years. 
Prior to the election, uh, being called, I had the pleasure of serving uh, for a second time on the Justice Committee. And on the 22nd of May of this year, in one of his last statements as Chair of the Justice Committee, Sir Bob Neil Casey said, Prisons are simply running out of space. My committee has long since warned of the dangers of successive governments ignoring the rise in jail numbers set against the workforce recruitment and retention crisis and a crumbling Victorian prison estate. Ministers and society must be prepared to invest in prison capacity and proper rehabilitation programmes as the current situation is unsustainable. That's from the former chair, Conservative Chair of the Justice Committee uh, on the 22nd of May of this year. The warning signs were there a long time ago, but the failure to invest has, has meant that we are now reaping the bitter harvest. I welcome the prison building programme and the, re and the renewal programme mentioned by my right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor. But in addition uh, to the measures proposed in this motion by my right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, I would like to suggest some further measures that may have a longer term impact in reducing the prison population. The first is court delays. The National Audit Office, in their report, Reducing the Backlog in the Crown Court, published in May of this year, found that at the end of December 2023, the outstanding Crown Court caseload was 65,573, of which 18,000 had been outstanding for a year or more. It also found that it took an average of 683 days from offence to completion of a case in the Crown Court and there was a staggering 16,005 people on remand as at the end of December 2023, one-third of which were awaiting sentencing and the remaining two-thirds awaiting trial. The remand population is at the highest it's been in over 50 years, and these are truly shocking fi figures, and the issue of remand prisons needs to be urgently addressed. The maxim, justice delayed is justice denied, is certainly apt, and we should also remember that delays in cases going on to trial also have an adverse impact on the victims and witnesses too. One of the causes of the delay is a shortage of criminal barristers and duty solicitors, whose numbers have been in decline since 2018. Uh, and this, in part, has been due to a serious underinvestment in our criminal justice system over the last two decades. And I genuinely hope that we will see the investment we need in the criminal justice system soon from this government. Uh, in relation to court dates and listing of trials, I very much hope that HMCTS gets smarter in how it uses time and space for court hearings. The second point I wish to make is about reoffending, and my right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, has touched on this. For the last quarter that stats are available from the MOJ's own figures, 33.4% of adults released from custody would go into reoffend again. This figure is way too high. Because reoffending is so high, it should come as no surprise to find that a large number of people being remanded for non are being remanded for non-violent offences due to their repeat offending. Many of these repeat offenders will have underlying vulnerabilities, such as drug abuse, homelessness and mental health issues, which will not have been properly addressed. So unless there is a coordinated approach to tackling uh, the causes of reoffending, we will see this endless revolving door cycle in our criminal justice system, which gives courts no option but to remand these repeat offenders into custody. I know that my right hon. Friend, the Lord Chancellor, is serious about taking action to address these issues, and I would ask her to coordinate uh, this with other departments too to, to help stop reoffending. The final point I wish to focus on is IPP prisoners. IPP, IPP prisoners account for approximately 3,000 prisoners in our prisons. In our prisons. The Justice Committee, in its report on IPP prisoners, said our primary recommendation is that Government brings forward legislation to enable a resentencing exercise in relation to all IPP sentenced individuals. This is the only way to address the unique injustice caused by the IPP sentence and its subsequent administration and to restore proportionality to the original sentence that were, sentences that were given. I have on previous occasions made this point that dealing with IPP prisoners who have spent more time in prison than they should have will not only help reduce the prison population but will have the effect of righting a wrong. Uh, in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, I very much welcome this motion as a short-term measure to deal with the overcrowding in our prisons uh, and it's also welcome my right honourable friend's commitment to an annual prison capacity statement uh, where we will see what effect that uh, this measure and other measures have on the prison population. Um, in addition to the building of more prisons, we also need an investment 
uh, in our criminal justice system and greater recruitment and retention of barristers, solicitors, prison officers uh, and also probation officers. And I was delighted to hear that my right hon. Friend has committed to uh, recruiting a thousand more probation officers, which would certainly help uh, address the issue of people um, who are on licence uh, after they have served part of their sentence. Uh, we need to clear the backlog of cases in the Crown Court, which will allow remand prisons to be dealt with sooner, and we also need to address the root causes of both offending and reoffending. Finally, we need to deal with the IPP prisoners to see what can be done to release those who are over tariff. I do hope this motion will pass today. It is a very good start in tackling the Gordian knots that, uh, that we, we are facing, but there is still more work that needs to be done. But I have every confidence in the Lord Chancellor and her team to deliver on that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Liberal Democrat spokesperson Wendy Chamberlain. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I congratulate you on your election and those of the other Deputy Speakers and welcome you to your place. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to say that I uh, welcome uh, the measures that have been outlined today um, in relation to um, what has been proposed, but I recognise, and the Liberal Democrats recognise, that this is probably the only step that the Government can take to deal with the situation. And that means that we are looking to relieve pressure on prisons against that backdrop of concern that the prison population is rising beyond the operational capacity of the prison estate. And indeed, the prison population at July 2024 in England and Wales was measured as 87,453, compared to an operational capacity of 88,864. And as other members have already highlighted, reoffending rates remain high, with 75% of ex-inmates reoffending within uh, nine years of release and 30, uh, nine, uh, sorry, nine months of release, and 39.3 within the first 12 months. And it's estimated that reoffending costs our society more than £18 billion a year. We should also recognise, Madam Deputy Speaker, that violence against prison staff has also soared as they cope with these capacity issues, with an average of 23 attacks recorded every day last year across England and Wales. And those issues with staff recruitment and retention have persisted, with English prisons running red regimes due to falling below minimum staffing levels at least 22 times in 2023. And yes, it is right to recognise that part of this is due to the backlog in our criminal courts, which skyrocketed under the previous Conservative government. And I find it quite stunning to hear the official opposition's response uh, today. Yeah. We want to work as a constructive opposition so that we can help uh, deal with issues around prison overcrowding. So to ask and be pressing uh, the Lord Chancellor for answers when they knew, know the answers and knew the answers before the last election is quite something. Remind Trans populations have risen by 84 per cent to a record high of over 16,000 people as of March 2024, and they account for almost 20 per cent of the total prison population. And it's quite clear, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we need action to that. And indeed, going back to the previous administration, they did recognise back in November 2023 the issues around prison overcrowding and introduced their own emergency measures. So surely they should recognise today that uh, further measures are necessary. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is about our criminal justice system as a whole, and trust in our criminal justice system as a whole is at an all-time low. Uh, the new government talks about being a government of service. I myself was a former police officer for 12 years, and I consider that to be part of a public service that I gave. But I do want to mention uh, the shocking footage uh, from Manchester Airport yesterday. As a former police officer, I was deeply disturbed by what I saw. But I also want to share um, my concern and thoughts with the families of the two police officers uh, and the members of the public who were seriously injured in a car accident on the M8 yesterday outside Glasgow. Um, the issues facing uh, the Lord Chancellor um, are not limited to England and Wales. Indeed, the Scottish Human Rights Commission has today published a report criticising the Scottish Government's glacial pace of change in tackling overcrowding, suicides and mental health provisions in our prisons. And only last month, the Scottish Government were making similar decisions to the Government today in relation to releasing prisoners earlier. And although, uh, like this government, there are exceptions to that overall approach, I absolutely understand the concerns of victims in seeing the early release of those who offended against them, and that is something that we must continue to recognise. And although the government have outlined that there will not be a sunset clause in today's uh, SI, and that they are looking to bring this to an end in 18 months, I would appreciate some clarity from the Lord Chancellor from a 
in terms of the reporting that will be made to this place uh, in relation to the progress that has been made. This House can only estimate uh, whether it continues to be an emergency situation if we are aware of the data and the effect of what has been proposed today. Um, we need to ensure that what the Government is doing um, is the right thing to do, but also what further steps they are taking. We must address the systemic issues in criminal courts where th these failures are also failing victims in relation to convictions in the first place. And the probation service is a critical part of this as well. And I do want to add that I watched the maiden speech, eh, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the other place of the new Minister for Prisons, Parole and Probation. And I was encouraged by what I heard. Uh, the Liberal Democrats are clear that cutting reoffending must be at the heart uh, of um, the government's plans to end the prison uh, crisis. So um, we know that prisons are in crisis. They are overcrowded, understaffed, and they are failing to rehabilitate offenders. And I'm just finding my other uh, notes. But we need to ensure that in terms of preventing reoffending, we are improving the provision of training, education, work opportunities in prisons so that we are actually ensuring that we reduce that reoffending, that we should be considering a through the gate mentorship programme and in introduce a plan to improve the rehabilitation of people leaving prison. Uh, the Liberal Democrats would want to implement a presumption against short sentences of 12 months or less to, re uh, to facilitate that rehabilitation in the community. Because as uh, the Minister in another place recognised yesterday, if we do not have the right conditions in our prisons, we are only actually making our prisons a place where people learn how to reoffend rather than preventing it. And we do need the probation services to have the resources uh, that they need. We need to improve and properly fund the supervision of offenders in the community with far greater coordination between the prison service, probation service providers, the voluntary and private sectors and local authorities. And that will achieve savings in the high costs of re-offending. Um, the Liberal Democrats today, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, recognise that this is the only option that the new government can take. As I say, I would not go far enough to say, uh, to say that I support what has been proposed today, but I recognise on behalf of my party that it is the only option left to the government at this time. Thank you. Yeah. Andy Slaughter. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is a pleasure to see you in your new and uh, much-deserved place. Uh, I rise to support this uh, difficult um, proposal by my uh, right honourable friend. Um, I made a speech two days ago in the King's Speech debate on the subject of prisons conditions, including on overcrowding, so I, I don't intend to repeat the whole of that speech here. It's tempting, but um, including the bits I had to leave out, but even by standards of this place, this is possibly pushing it. Um, uh, what I would say is that um, the the team, the, 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 my honourable friend and her team, and indeed the, the, the new prisons minister in, in the other place, Lord Timpson, are, have set out with a clear and serious intent to solve the problems which have been left by the previous government. And I'm afraid we saw from the opposition spokesman today uh, exactly why they got us into this mess. No yeah, yeah. attempt to be accountable, not allowing one uh, intervention in that speech, which is almost unknown, I think. And we can understand why, because there are no answers to the questions yeah, yeah, yeah. which can be put to, to the op opposition uh, here. Uh, they've left our prisons in an absolutely disastrous state. 99% in, in a moment, in a moment, 99% you know, uh, capacity for the last 18 months, a complete dereliction of duty, um, acute capacity in a moment, uh, acute capacity pressures, so that the impact assessment says that if we continued without taking this action, this would mean prisons would shortly run out of places and the justice system would no longer be able to function as intended, e.g. the police would be unable to make arrests and the judiciary may not be able to impose immediate custodial sentences. What an indictment of any government. Of course, I'll give way. The fact that the Labour government is now going to have to release 5,000 prisoners that it wouldn't want to release. Mm. How would you describe the fact that the previous Labour government had to release 80,000 prisoners that it didn't want to release? That, if that's really the best they've got, I understand why the, why the Shadow Minister didn't take, didn't take any, any interventions. <coughs> they had, they've had plenty of money for the Rwanda scheme and other gimmicks over the past 18 months. They've had no 
money, no resources, no intent to deal with it. And we heard the reason for that because they thought they would win votes by leaving the prisons in a crisis situation. Well, that was another, another miscalculation, I'm afraid. Um, it is true, however, that this is not an easy decision. Um, uh, I was reassured by what my honourable friend and what the supporting documents to the, the SI today have said in relation to recall will continue as before, the length of sentences won't change, uh, sexual and serious violent offences are excluded, and there will be, contrary to what the opposition alleged, uh, there is an intention that this will run for no more than, than 18 months. Th those are all important safeguards. But it, it's also true that this will put pressure on. There will be cost savings, of course, but there will be pressures on the probation service. Uh, it says in the explanatory memorandum there's a package of measures to alleviate probation pressures, including limited post-sentence supervision to non-multi-agency public protection arrangements. Um, so there, there are consequences here. There are consequences for post-custody accommodation services, uh, as we've heard, which are not working terribly well at the moment. There are consequences for the police uh, if there are situations of reoffending or recall that need to be dealt with. Um, but it will mean a reduction from September onwards of a minimum of, say, 5,000 prison places for a period of time. And that is simply necessary. It's not really debatable. I think that's probably why the opposition haven't debated it today. It's, uh, it, it is not possible to continue. Now, I hope that this short-term measure will be successful. I think it will be. I hope that the safeguards will be in place and will be secure. But I'm also encouraged by what my right hon. Friend says about the, the longer-term prospects. We have to address the prisons crisis over the longer term in this country. We have to reduce the number of people in custody by reducing reoffending. Uh, it's good that we're building modern prisons to modern standards, but I would like to see those modern prisons not supplementing but replacing some of the disgusting and disgraceful Victorian prisons, like Wormwood Scrubs, which I was in my constituency until just a, a few weeks ago. And for members who don't ha ha have a prison in their constituencies or who don't regularly visit those prisons, I advise all of them, irrespective of their interest, and presumably being this debate, they have some interest, to go and look at the conditions that are persisting. They are inhumane, they are intolerable, and that is not just a matter for staff, inmates, and those who work in prisons. It's a matter for all of us as citizens because we are not rehabilitating prisoners. We are letting them out onto the streets to reoffend without any support in that way. And this, the need for this SI today is an indication of just how low the previous government has brought that system. This is a national crisis. I've no doubt that it was one of the reasons for the, prior, the previous Prime Minister calling an early election, because they simply could not face the consequences of their own action. Thank goodness, Madam Deputy Speaker, we now have a government that will grasp these nettles firmly and will resolve these, these, these issues. I just say to my honourable friend, which I know she is passionate about as well, this is not just about uh, a short-term fix. This is about a long-term change in how we use the criminal justice system in this country, all parts of which are in crisis at the moment. But if we can get into a virtuous spiral rather than the, the downward spiral that we've been in for the last 14 years, there is hope both to improve the court system, to improve access to justice, to improve the, the service that the service is provided, including for victims, and to deal with the crisis in our prisons. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's a genuine pleasure to see you in the chair today, so congratulations on your role. I'm actually going to begin by welcoming the, shadow fr um, the new front bench to their positions and the Lord Chancellor, the Honourable Lady, who I've known for a number of years, and I do congratulate her in um, taking up the post, and also our front bench team as well. Um, it is right, and it has marginally been touched on, that the first duty of any government is the protection, the safety and security of the public. 
And there are so many measures and so many um, sen sentences, but also crimes out there that clearly the state has to manage. And we have a duty collectively to ensure that the British public are protected. Alongside having robust measures when it comes to counter-terrorism, back in our armed forces, we have amazing intelligence services as well that form part of that matrix that the Lord Chancellor will now become familiar with. And of course, keeping our streets safe by investing both in the police, but also in the criminal justice system. And part of that obviously means that the most dangerous, harmful, serious, persistent offenders should be in prison and kept off the streets to keep the public safe. And it's important that we have the right deterrent. Now, if I may gently um, open and start my remarks, the front bench, if I may, clearly are making a great deal of play about the role of the last government and the decisions that took place in the last parliament. But it is quite telling that one of the first pieces of this legislation this government is seeking to pass is that one that basically looks at the early release of prisoners, 5,500 in a matter of weeks. Um, and I have looked at the impact assessment as well. And I note in the impact assessment, the Lord Chancellor will be familiar with this, there's option zero and option one. I understand the situation that she has been asked to look at. But I would like to hear in her closing remarks that what alternatives were looked at other than the blanket scheme itself. Um, but she also has touched on the previous parliament. And I think for the record, I would just like to say to colleagues, in the previous parliament, we saw actually Labour MPs campaigning to block the removal of foreign national offenders from being deported from our prisons. We saw them oppose the Police Crime Courts and Sentencing Act and the tougher sentences that were introduced for sexual and violent offenders. And I do want to come on to the release of some of these offenders short, shortly as well. They oppose the life sentences for people smugglers in the National Anti Borders Act, which we do know is making a difference. And so it is concerning that now with this um, release of 5,500 prisoners um, and reducing the time of most offenders stay in custody from 50% to 40%, it's going to cause concern with the public and particularly the victims of crime. And it is just, I do want to ask some specific areas of the Lord Chancellor. She has touched on them, but I would like her to expand upon them, which is when it comes to this, the early release provisions, there are clear offences, sexual offences, domestic abuse offences that have been listed in the schedule. She's outlined about community orders, tagging. I think it's important, particularly for women who have been the victims, what provisions will be put in place for them. I think it's really important that they understand this. And also when it comes to offenders that were responsible for racially aggravated assaults and some of the real harm that comes the way, particularly also with offenders with past convictions for sexual offences and perpetrators of domestic abuse who might be serving time in custody, and now, and also for other offences who could be freed early. Mm. What we do know, and the Lord Chancellor will know this, these are the type of perpetrators who don't just offend once, they have a whole litany and a history of aggravated offences. And we cannot simply release these people out into the community because these blanket offences do cause problems. And it would be very helpful, um, the Lord Chancellor is well aware um, of, I think it's fair to say, the cross-party nature of this, the debate around victims and the support around victims over actually the last decade, I think it's fair to say. I've, I've spoken about a victim's bill. I know the Honourable Lady has as well. How we can actually work to achieve that. There will, of course, be impacts upon wider services. And it's been raised already, I think it's the Honourable Member for North East Fife in particular. But I'd like to ask about the impacts on our police probation and housing services. Um, there is no clear plan in the impact assessment. I note from the Lord Chancellor's um, statement, she has said that'll come. I think to quote her, um, officials are working at pace. This is a term that we are going to hear a lot of on these benches from the benches opposite. I've got don't, no doubt about that. But the papers published with this order don't give any indication 
of how local authorities and which local authorities are going to be particularly affected by, these, um, by the early release. Um, and I think it would be very important for local authorities and MHCLG in particular, with her department, I think should be publishing this information. She's spoken passionately about the transparency she's going to be bringing around data releases and numbers. I would urge that we have this sooner rather than later. And I think it was a member from her own bench spoke about homelessness that results as well, particularly in the City of London. We see this already. That, that is a local authority duty as well. And there are statutory duties in place where we know these need to be managed. There will be pressures on housing stock. There are already pressures on housing stock. So I think um, asking the government to publish a list of local authorities that will be affected, I think, is vital. But also the implications for families and individuals on housing registers. They'll be worried now about the implications for them while they've been actually waiting patiently on housing lists as well. There'll be pressures on other parts of the criminal justice system. What resources will be put into the criminal justice system? Will resources be re redirected? What about police officers who will now be tied up with monitoring offenders um, and their early release and dealing with those that are re-offending? The honourable, right honourable lady has already spoken about re-offending and breaches um, and breaches of conditions, which will mean going back to prison. But how will that be managed within policing when police officers will be taken away from policing activities? So if I may politely say, Clarity is required, and I think it's that kind of um, specificity, in particular for local authorities and police forces, and our police and crime commissioners will want to know more about this as well. Yeah. I would like to press the Lord Chancellor on the um, time around um, this decision. It's been touched on already. In the impact assessment says the Lord Chancellor announced her intention for the change to be temporary. The change will be reviewed after 18 months to ensure it's still necessary. It would be, I think, helpful to be indicative around the whole concept of the sunset clause. She's very familiar with sunset clauses. We've all debated legislation. But actually, to give clarity that this is not going to be permanent, um, that, I think, actually the public, as well as this House, needs to be assured on that in particular. Um, and I think all members who are voting today need to have assurance on that. I think that's act absolutely important. I'd like to ask about the prison population reduction from the 5,500 in particular, because again, in the impact assessment, it considers a period over 10 years. The central scenario assumes there will be a 5,500 fewer prison places required than will otherwise be needed in a steady state over a 10-year period. The average annual savings for HMPPS due to reduction in prisons running costs are estimated to be £219 million per annum. That's at 2024-25 figures. Over a 10-year period, there will be a transitional benefit of reducing the additional number of prison places that needs to be constructed, with an estimated benefit of over £2.2 billion. If I may, Madam Deputy Speaker, that's significant money, um, and clearly that will have an impact on the prison building programme. I notice, if I may, that the Lord Chancellor, when she, I think, um, gave her first speech around prison capacity and the strain, she actually spoke from the new Five Worlds prison in Welling Wellingborough, um, a prison that was built actually under the last government and has been delivered. I think it would be very useful to hear more about the implications of that 2.2 billion. We did hear during the general election that the government were going to continue with the prison building plans and programmes put in place and change the planning laws. But the impact assessment assumes that there will be a permanent reduction in the prison population of 5,500. So I would like to hear more about the modelling of future prison places and prison numbers, whether or not there will be an expansion of existing prison sites. Um, there is a super prison, or there were plans for a super prison already, um, I think actually in Lancashire, whether or not that will be expanded as well. And alongside this, I think understanding more about the financial impacts of this policy and how her department, the Ministry of Justice, the Treasury and the OBR will be scoring this and accounting for this, because the impact assessment does suggest more than a £2 billion saving on reducing the number of prison places to be constructed and more than £200 million a year of savings from reducing the number of offenders in prisons. This is a balancing act, but I think for the importance of clarity when it comes to law and <coughs> order 
and the government's own direction of travel when it comes to keeping our streets safe and when it comes to also the points that I've made. I think we need to know by the um, Lord Chancellor if these savings will be banked for the forthcoming fiscal forecast um, or that will become um, from the Ministry, the Treasury and the OBR and especially with the budget and comprehensive spend and review in the autumn that is coming too. So the government has afforded the House um, 90 precious minutes to debate this early release of 5,500 prisoners. The prison building programme, just by this impact of state, if I may, Madam Deputy Speaker, from where I stand and sit, looks as if it's being reduced and cut, and I am concerned that this will put the public in grave danger. I'm worried about that, and I think it's right that we continue throughout um, debates, probably post-recess now, we continue to discuss this. This is one of the first legislative acts of this government. Um, it will have implications for public confidence when it comes to law and order. Mm. I don't need to expand upon that. The Lord Chancellor is very well versed in all of this as well. We have to be cognizant of the impact of what this means for victims, um, and I think we really should focus upon that. But also the wider functioning of the criminal justice system. Um, the Lord Chancellor will know that in the last Parliament we had Operation Satira in particular that looked at the integration of policing, the criminal justice system and the court system, the prison system, very much to give um, victims of the most abhorrent sexual abuses public confidence. Will this program have a knock-on impact upon some of those key programs? Um, and I really would like to have some answers from the Lord Chancellor. I think it, transparency is important. She's spoken about transparency to, to today as well during this debate, but I think, you know, I have grave concerns. I know this um, side of the um, chamber has great concerns about public safety and security, but also the wider implications now for housing, prisons, probation, police and law and order, and obviously public safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I congratulate you on taking your space, even more so as a Muslim female in this house of Kashmiri heritage. It gives me great pleasure and pride to see not only a deputy Muslim female of Kashmiri heritage, but also actually the Lord Chancellor, the first female Muslim of Kashmiri heritage. And I'm sure the whole house and indeed the whole country share our pride in celebrating Britain at its best, the house at its best, and democracy at its best. So thank you. I'm really, really grateful for the Lord Chancellor for all the work that she is doing to address this issue and picking up the mess left by the previous government. I would also welcome perhaps a little bit of humility from the Shadow Minister. The reason we didn't vote with his, with his government's policies was because precisely they weren't, didn't have a plan, they didn't know what they were doing, otherwise we wouldn't be having this mess to clear up on their behalf. And people recognise that, which is why we're having to deal with it. Uh, I would also like to make a request to the uh, Lord Chancellor that perhaps during her review, might she accept an invitation to visit Bradford West, the Muslim Women's Project that uh, supports Muslim women in prison their return out into the community. Because we understand and we all in this House recognise the disparity of services and rehabilitation when it comes to people of ethnic minority heritage. Um, and that, would, that is an open invitation, but once again, I'd just like to thank you for picking up the doing, and especially giving huge consideration to the sentences that the Lord Chancellor is proposing to reduce and to make sure that we are still protecting the public, which the previous government failed to do, and protecting them by making sure we are keeping those that are the serious offenders, not putting them in that category, and doing the best that we can do for our country. Thank you. Sir John Hayes. I'm very grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker, and welcome to the Chair. I only have three brief points to make. The first is that we need an honest debate in this place about the purpose of prison. Of course it's true that prison exists to protect those who otherwise might suffer harm. We incarcerate people because they're dangerous. But prison also matters for the reason of punishment. Yeah. To incarcerate someone who's done something wrong yeah. is to deprive them of their liberty and it is to punish them. And we should be straightforward that most of our constituents believe in just retribution. Yeah. Yeah. 
They don't actually spend their time like so much of the Liberal establishment do, agonising about the circumstances of criminals. They're more concerned about the circumstances of victims. And so prison works for that reason above all else. It is a deprivation of liberty uh, endured by those that deserve to endure it. And my constituents, and I suspect those of members across this House, will be outraged at the idea that some of those people are now going to be let loose on our streets. And I accept, I accept that there are exceptions set out in the proposals for the House. Um, but I have to tell you uh, that had the previous government introduced this, I would have voted against it. Yep. And I'll be voting against it today. And indeed, I tabled amendments, along with the former Home Secretary and many others of my colleagues, that would have uh, further altered these provisions. And I uh, won't go into the detail, Madam Deputy Speaker, because you wouldn't allow me to do so, I suspect. But I just advise uh, the new Minister to take a look at those amendments to see what further steps can be taken to mitigate this very unfortunate circumstance, uh, if that's the least, before that is the least we can do. The second point I want to make uh, is about the specifics of this proposal. Uh, it's already been said that the way of dealing with the prison population is twofold in essence. One is to reduce the number of people on remand, by improving the throughput of people from arrest to trial. The second is to reduce the population by uh, dealing with foreign national offenders. Remand prisoners represent about 20% of the population. Foreign national offenders are now number, as the Minister will know, many, many thousands. You can take people out of the system by dealing with those two things, and also you can build more prisons. Now, I accept that the previous government should have done more, but this government should look at urgent prison building. We are able to build Nightingale hospitals <coughs> at a stroke. Why can't we have Fry prisons built as a temporary measure at least, in order to accommodate many of the people who would otherwise commit further crimes. And my final point, and it's been made repeatedly, and I'm being brief because I know you will want me to be so, and Madam Deputy Speaker, and I want to support you as much as I possibly can in your new role. Uh, my final point is simply this. If this is a temporary provision, as the former Home Secretary just said, why is there no sunset clause? Yeah. 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 Because it's all very well saying there will be a review in 18 yeah. months. Yeah. Yep. But a sunset clause, of course, exactly. would mean it had to come back to this yes. House for further yeah, yeah, yeah. consideration. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the difference between something that's written yeah. in the proposal, in the legislation, and something which is promised yeah. Yeah. in the form of review from the SPAC clause. Now, I, I have no reason not to believe the Honourable Lady's promises. I take them at face value. But let's have some substance around those promises by a sunset clause yeah. being built into this bill. And I think that would, at very least, show the good faith, yeah. which is the necessary component of good government. Yeah. So prison works, let's build more prisons, and let's say to our constituents that we're no longer going to pander the predilections, preoccupations, the prejudices of the Liberal establishment. We're going to speak for them. For what they believe is what I believe, that many more wicked people should be incarcerated for much longer. That's what they believe. That's what they say to you on the doorsteps if you knocked on them in any constituency in this country. So it's about time it was said here. And I'm delighted to say it has now been said by me. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I think closing remarks by the Lord Chancellor. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. With your permission and with the leave of the House, I will respond to the debate. But let me begin by saying what a pleasure it has been to do my first piece of legislation in this House <coughs> under your chairmanship. A fellow small heathen Bromme, no doubt, and is a great first for the community uh, from which both of us uh, come, come from. Madam Deputy Speaker, I was astonished by the Shadow Minister's uh, remarks. Uh, he, he said that he was deeply troubled by the measure that we are bringing before the House today, but he and the, uh, his party, which was the previous government, were not troubled enough to prevent this crisis uh, from occurring in the first place. The Shadow Minister knows full well that they have left no other option on the table but that which we are taking today. And anyone with any access to a newspaper can tell that uh, until about three weeks ago, this was their own plan. Uh, so, Madam Deputy Speaker, this, I'm afraid to say, is the modern-day Tory party, opportunistic, cynical and, frankly, unfit to govern. Uh, 
he asked a number of questions, most of which I had addressed uh, in my opening uh, remarks. Let me remind him, and he should know, our prisons are at over 99 per cent capacity. The exact number will fluctuate on a day-by-day -day basis, but everybody who works within criminal justice knows that our prisons will overflow by September unless we pass the measure that we are taking uh, today. And, uh, on the issue of both the sunset clause and exclusions for uh, domestic violence-linked uh, offences, I will take no lessons from the party opposite. They brought forward the end of custody supervised licence scheme that had no exclusions for domestic abuse. I raised that issue many times myself when I was sitting on the benches opposite, yeah. and the, the then Tory government simply stonewalled and did not give any answers whatsoever. So I'm very pleased to see that members opposite have finally discovered that we should treat victims of domestic abuse differently than what we have previously yeah, done, yeah. Uh, but they should have really applied that to their own yeah. measure. That was yeah. their government. Government's policy until just three weeks ago. I will also take no lessons from the party opposite on a sunset clause because I will remind them that the end of custody supervised licence scheme not only did not have a sunset clause, but it was in fact extended by the previous Tory government from 18 days to 35 days to 60 days, and then we had the ignominy of an increase to 70 days, which came without any announcement yeah. whatsoever. Oh. And so when I say that this government will be different than the last. I mean it. We have already been far more transparent than the previous government ever was or could have dreamed of being, and that is the vein in which we will uh, continue. Um, I, I was pleased that my uh, honourable friend, the member for Southgate and Wood Green, uh, raised the issue of reoffending, which came up uh, from the Lib De Liberal Democrat spokesperson, the member for North East Fife, as well. It is crucial and critical that we get the rates of reoffending down. And let me uh, turn to the point made by the member for uh, South Holland and the deepings. Um, I am slightly perturbed that I find myself in agreement with his first point. I do uh, agree that prisons are about punishment, but I would also say to him that when you have a rate of reoffending, when 80 per cent of offenders are reoffenders, yes. something is going very horribly wrong within our prisons. And every time you have somebody coming out of our prison estate who is a better criminal than they were when they went in, that creates more victims, and we are letting our public down if we do not get the rates of reoffending down. So cutting reoffending is a strategy for putting victims first and cutting crime as much as it is by help, about helping those prisoners become better citizens. So I hope that he will take my comments uh, in the spirit in which they are intended, which is a good faith response to his remarks, and reflect upon the necessity of this country finally getting its shocking rates of reoffending down and putting the public uh, first. Um, if, I if I might return to the points made by my for uh, Enfield, just, just on IPP prisoners, they are, ex they are not included within this uh, measure today. I know he and others in this House uh, have supported the possibility of a re resentencing exercise, which we did not support in opposition. It is not the policy uh, of this Government, because we cannot take any steps, and whilst I do want to make progress where IPP prisoners are concerned, we cannot take any steps that would put public protection at risk. It is a delicate balancing act, but we will start with the measures actually passed by the previous government in the Victims and Prisoners Act on the changes to the licence period and the action plan, uh, which we will publish as soon as possible. And Where possible, I would want to make progress where IPP prisoners uh, are are concerned. Uh, my honourable friend, the member for Hammersmith and Chiswick, made a really important point on the costs. Uh, there is a cost to action, the action that we are taking today, but there is a much bigger cost to inaction. Uh, if we fail to take this measure uh, today, we would face the total collapse of the criminal justice system, and I think that that catastrophic uh, disaster has to be averted at all costs. Let me turn to the comments from uh, the honourable lady, the member for Whitham. I. Um, I, I, I'm pleased uh, in, in, about the way in which she uh, responded uh, to the debate. Let me assure her, particularly on matters of national security, such as they touch upon my responsibilities as Lord Chancellor, we will always take a cross-party approach and look to work together in the national interest. She raised important points about the join-up between different uh, service providers, whether that's police, local authorities and others. I've already chaired a criminal justice board. We already have an implementation task force that will work over 
over the summer to make sure all of the different agencies are working together to make sure that the rollout in September is successful. And my ministers will be working with ministers in MHCLG as well uh, to make sure that that join up uh, does occur. That is an important point, and I will be taking a close personal interest in the implementation myself. Um, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, yes. The Lord Chancellor for giving way. Would she be able to expand, probably not today in this debate, but over the, over the summer or even in September, around the particular local authorities? Because this whole point about prison building is not going to go away. I believe we need more prisons and we should be building more prisons. And that should come forward from the previous prison programme as well. There is this whole issue about finances, the 2.2 billion that I referred to. But also, would she commit to publishing a list of local authorities that she's proactively working with, perhaps from the previous prison building programme, where we will see more prisons? Uh, I, I will happily uh, return or write to uh, the Honourable Lady in respect of local authorities. It, it is uneven, the impact of uh, prison uh, capacity, but it is in flux also on a daily basis. And so, uh, but I will, I, will, I will write to her about specific uh, local authorities. And let me just say on the issue of money and long-term supply of prison places, uh, we will be publishing a 10-year prison capacity strategy, which will deal with the uh, long-term plans that our government has to increase supply of prison places in this country. I will. We do indeed need to build more prisons for, as the Honourable Member said, the present stock are not fit for purpose. But if you're building more prisons to increase capacity, you'll just end up with more prisoners. All the evidence suggests, all the evidence suggests, it's prison population is a supply-led industry. More prisons mean more prisoners. And I would remind you, the, honour, the, the Minister, that your colleague in the other place has made clear that a third, a third of prisoners shouldn't be there. So what is the Minister going to do to look at alternatives to prison for the sad and wretched, not the cruel and dangerous? Well, let me be clear to the uh, Honourable Gentleman and this House. This Government will make sure that we have the prison places that we need to make sure that we can protect the public uh, and, and uh, deal with the supply side issues that we have inherited from the previous Government, who did not build the 20,000 that they said would be ready by next year. And in fact, we're only at 6,000 uh, delivered by that previous uh, Tory Government. Uh, we will also, uh, in addition to providing the prison places that this country needs, deal with the problem of reoffending because we are determined to make sure we do not keep creating more and more victims. Uh, that is a strategy for cutting crime in this country and for putting uh, victims first. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, w this government has taken action where before us came inaction. And once this action takes effect from September of this year, we will be able to end the immediate crisis in our prison, giving us time to introduce the desperately needed long-term measures. Uh, this has been welcomed by voices across the criminal justice system, from senior police officers to my own predecessor in this role. It is the only safe option available to us, and to choose to act otherwise would leave our country in a state of unconscionable risk, one that I am not willing to take. For that for that reason, Madam Deputy Speaker, I commend the draft instrument to the House. Yeah. The question is, as on the order paper, as many of that opinion say aye. Aye. On the contrary, no. 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 Division, clear the lobby. The question is as on the order paper, as many of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Tell us for the ayes are Gerald Jones and Keir Mather. Tell us for the noes are Mike Wood and Miss Joy Morrissey.
order. The eyes to the right, 323. The nose to the left, 81. The eyes were 323, the nose were 81, so the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Unlock. Unlock. Yeah.